Hello and welcome to Snyder's Return, a tabletop roleplay podcast. My guest today is a shining, no, a radiant star of the TTRPG community, guiding and crafting stories drawn from the cosmos above and from the heart within. From producing island hopping adventures to kickstarting romances, she has not yet reached her peak, but creates a safe space, a citadel, for us to engage and become a collective within. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome TTRPG game designer, content creator, actual play producer, and creative laureate, Taylor Navarro, to the show. Taylor, thank you so much for joining me. Oh my gosh, that might be the nicest introduction I've ever had in my entire life. (laughs) Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to to say all of those things. I enjoyed the puns on my work. And it is all your work, and and that is the reason why I've asked you to come on and join me for for a, a chat, the interview today, to go through some of your incredible work and your achievements and the recognition you've received for those things. But before we dive into all of that, Taylor, how did you get into tabletop role playing games, please? Okay, so every time I tell this, I actually realise there was a step before the thing that I've <laughs> spoken about. Uh, so we start. Uh, in um, year four or fourth grade for Americans with a little girl who liked to write stories in English um, who was encouraged to do that and at the same sort of time her stepdad was very into war games and had nobody to play with Mm -hmm. and so I was the only one who ended up playing with him so I had I had a start in in war games um, and as I kind of grew up, we, uh, I love board games and all, and all those kind of stuff. Uh, and one of my favorite stories is when um, me and my sister were playing Risk with my dad um, and we started taking his men hostage and like crafting little narratives so that way he couldn't uh, keep putting armies back on the board. Mm. Um, and from there, I kind of took a break for, from gaming and became a fan fiction writer and a fan girl in my teen years as, you know, women are well people are want to do and from there like I started like venturing into different fandoms and I started watching a YouTube channel called Drawfee who had a mini series called Dungeons and Drawfee which was like a choose your own story thing but I was on the discord at the time and people were like this is not Dungeons and Dragons please stop calling it Dungeons and Dragons we will run Dungeons and Dragons for you so you know what it is (laughs) and obviously being British I kind of like seen Dungeons and Dragons referenced on American shows, Mm. but you know, and it's like, that is like a completely alien concept to me. I have no idea what that means or why these people are being seen in a, or shown in a certain light. So I was like, yeah, sure. I'll try Dungeons and Dragons. I like telling stories, you know, this was just at the end of my fan fiction era. And uh, I was in the game and I was like, oh, this is, this is a bit much for me. Um, but then somebody else was like, let me try it GMing for you a different way um, with like much more railroady way than like a bunch of new players being thrown in a sandbox. Mm. And I found that I loved it. Like my first proper character was a tabaxi and I like leaning into that cat thing of like licking things I shouldn't lick. I had, my constitution was my dump stat and I was making con rolls all the time where I was like, and like slotting things over and that was how like I investigated as uh, I think I was a bard with the high investigation so um and it kind of snowballed from there and that like I was playing every Sunday mm. um and changed groups uh I uh started uh hang on I changed groups yeah and then I helped one of my friends from my previous group uh, with a charity, uh, with a charity supplement for the DM Guild, mm. which I was project managing on that. I had no idea how to make um, a D and D supplement, but my friend wanted to do a charity thing for the NAACP. I wanted to help them, and from there I learned how to edit. Um, so then I bullied my DM into writing for me, so I could edit it <laughs> and put it on the DM Guild, and we could split it. Uh, and then from there I became an artificer in our home game, and. My DM was like, Taylor, just write up these magic items that you're creating. You don't need me to do it. You know how to do it better than me because you edit. And I was like, okay. So I did. And then I was like, oh, I like designing things. Oh, I love creating things. This is like writing fan fiction for like a world and an adventure that people get to interact with more deeply. Mm. Um, Oh, this is very, very fun. And then 
I just decided not to stop and I've kept going and I've kept going <laughs> and now I'm here. <laughs> and here is an amazing place uh, to be and you as you say, you haven't stopped. Uh, and uh, But before we do keep going, uh, anyone inspired by that, where can they go to find you on social media, on, on the internet and, and all those various places and spaces you may inhabit? Um, so my Twitter is at Taylor Ann, A-N-N-N-X. Uh, so that's my Twitter handle. Uh, you can also go to taylornavarrotttrpgs.card.co. Um, which is where you'll find links to all of my other things. I do have a Tumblr. You could find it somewhere on my website if you look hard enough. Um, If you want to see me fangirl about Dimension 20 over there, or if you want to see me fangirl about Ties That Bind, which is an actual play of The Corrupted on Twitter. Hmm. Like, I'm a fan of things. I continue to be a fan of things. Um, But also on both platforms, I talk about my work um, in different aspects, long form versus short form. So if you want to see me do things on the internet, I guess Twitter or Tumblr or like keep checking my my website every like two to three months there's something new. <laughs> All right. Well, I will make sure there are links to those and your itch and any Kickstarter project you're associated with and all the DMs Guild products you are associated with uh, down in the description so below. So please scroll down, follow those links and support Taylor. Uh, Taylor, quick sidebar, fan fictions. What, what were your favorite or favored uh fandoms to be a part of just before we move on uh so i am one of those people that i was in one fandom and then when i felt like i didn't belong there anymore i moved on to the next one Mm. so um as a typical uh british teenager in the early 10s uh I was in the Harry Potter fandom before we knew that J.K. Rowling was a turf, and when I was like, I was done with that because trans rights are human rights, uh, and I moved on to Welcome to Night Vale, which is a um, like a horror radio show podcast, and from there I moved on to um, Drawfee, and then Drawfee was kind of like the end of my fandom hopping era as I moved into tabletop RPGs. D&D specifically, and then branching out to more indie stuff. Absolutely. Well, fair enough. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so, <clears throat> moving away from fandoms into tabletops then, uh, you became an, you self-taught editing, became an editor, and have no, been... No, 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 I am not self-taught. I do need to uh, shout out people who put me where I am. Uh, so, in the first project I did, the Book of Lost Magica, it's on the DMs Guild. It is a it's one of the products that 90, I think it's 99% of it goes to the NAACP. Um, Alison Huang, also known as Drusillian, was one of the editors on that who held me by the hand and showed me the SRD like, and taught me all of the basics on how to edit for mm-hmm. that. Um, and then the combined efforts of Laura Hersbrenner, Sadie Lowry, Hannah Rose. What a team. Um, yeah, back in the, a few years ago, on Twitter, they used to post editing yes. stuff yeah. all the time, like tips and tricks and how to do it. And I followed them because I was looking for more women in the industry mm-hmm. and they were sharing knowledge. And I just bookmarked a bunch of their blog posts, like a bunch of their their tweets. Um, and I used it and compiled it all into like a big like uh, word document for myself that I reference to this day when I'm editing. So not self-taught i was very lucky that there were people in the industry willing to share their knowledge and that is how i developed that skill set well you have joined them amongst the inspirational women uh, and people within the community so it's it's such an amazing uh sort of thank you transition from sort of student to mentor uh or laureate and we'll, we'll touch on that shortly but moving from fandom to uh sort of self-generated things you have created your own games, uh, which can be found on Itch and, and other places. Uh, and you've also worked on official D&D products and spin-off products moving into AP. So what has it been like sort of navigating this creative space and, and, and having all these different creative outputs? Um, I haven't worked on any official D&D products yet. That is like my dream job to one day be able to say that I have done that. Um, I did work on it's uh so the DM Guild partners with the release of official content. Mm. Um, so I did edit on uh oh gosh, Journeys Beyond the Radiant Citadel is what I edited on, which had the writers from the original book, but it was like a 
in theory self-published um what like a company piece yeah. um so sorry i just wanted to clarify course, that like course. for the listeners could you repeat the question please yeah so uh you you have all these many and create uh many and very creative outputs what has it been like sort of turning your hand to each of them uh say your game creation for constellation and crafting uh dice of life and so on and so forth what has it been like to be be a game designer or creator being a game designer after being an editor is difficult but also so much easier because so when I'm designing for like Dungeons and Dragons products because I'm so familiar with the rule set Mm. because as an editor you have to look at it with like a critical mind um I find that making things for that is quite easy because I know everything so well and in what I don't know I know where to go and look it up and research it going into the indie stuff was very kind of like scary for me in a way because it's like okay there are no more guidelines I make the rules and making the rules is fun but it's also a little bit daunting because you're like okay I need to make the rules in a way that sounds very distinctly different from D&D but is also clear and concise because one of my things is like I love one page games and you'll you'll see that because I've got like a whole bunch of one page games because you have to very clearly convey the rules and the concept um, and there's there's just no space to kind of go on little brain tangents <laughs> you, <laughs> you know um, because people won't want most people don't want to pick up games that are too difficult to play so you have to convey your ideas very like succinctly succinctly is the word that i'm that i'm looking for um so it's 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 interesting because there are there are like you could go away and you could like look at textbooks on game design um i don't do that i design games from uh i guess the heart which sounds a bit silly to say um but it's very much a a case of you know what do i want to make uh what do i think is what i think is fun like constellation crafting chaos mode um was like something so when i'm in like a ttrpg session while i'm listening to other people i like to fidget and i always try and roll my dice to the highest number um and then i'll just leave them there and i'll pick up the next one because i'm a dice dragon and i have loads of them so it keeps me occupied and i was like okay uh what if there's a game where you have to roll to the highest number um what if it was a game that you had to roll to the highest number fast because the more people that are there the trickier it becomes to keep track um and it's like this this whole chaotic thing of like you know when like you're talking with your friend and you're like oh what if we did this what if we did this what if we did this and it's like this really like um hyping each other up Mm. world building that sometimes happens in a in a game or like planning for a session i was like okay i want to take that feeling that goes that kind of i associate personally with my dice because of like when that happens versus when i'm rolling my dice to the highest number and I'm going to combine it and I'm going to make it into a game and I'm going to make it a one page game because it's for a one page game jam. And also it fits this theme of like something very brief, hmm. but something very fun. And it's very intense. I think the game, the longest it's lasted is um, 15 minutes because during like one of the scenes where you pause the game and you discuss like a world building thing. Uh, two people were having a disagreement and because we could have come to a decision <laughs> it like bumped up the time <laughs> by a lot but the shortest the shortest it was is was like a total of five minutes really? including the pauses um but but yeah i'm like with game design i kind of just go with what i think would be fun for other people to play and i often try and like convey my own experiences um through like not only like just the mechanics of my game but like the way that i structure my team around it like the length of the game um and other and other bits like that that a lot of thought goes into it yeah it's like a puzzle it's like a really fun puzzle sorry i've realized i'm rambling no not at all no 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 no. (laughs) my brain goes ah how do i do this and it's like oh well it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that and i think the main thing like for listeners to kind of take away from my ramblings i'm making it up as i go along 
And I feel like a lot of game designers are also doing like that. We'll be inspired by like media and mm. other games and like our own ideas of what would be fun. But TTRPGs is just playing pretend. And the people who are making the guidelines for you are literally just making them up. And I'm one of those people who's just making it up <laughs> as I go along. Happily, no, happy with that. Uh, and you mentioned there sort of things uh, sort of from the heart. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'd like to touch on your current Kickstarter campaign for Not Yet, which is a uh, romantic duet gym, uh, GM, I put gymless, GMless uh, experience mm. for, for two players. Where was the inspiration from that? How is the Kickstarter going? And um, what's it like to have sort of broken through so many of the, the stretch goals of, effectively? So the Kickstarter ended a couple of days ago. And when I say I am absolutely like, in shock, blown away by the positive response. Um, so Not Yet was inspired by a couple of things. Uh, my first thought around this game was, what if there was a game where you had to like roll and match die, the number on the dice had to match the other person's for the cool thing to happen? And I was like, you know, and I was thinking about that. And then I was like, ah, oh, this could be like a romantic thing, like, you know, ships passing in the night, that kind of thing. Uh, just like How I Met Your Mother. I don't know if people have seen it as an American uh, sitcom. And it's about like a man called Ted who's trying to find the, the love of his life, essentially. He wants to settle down, grow old and have kids. And it's his misadventures in love and the surrounding cast as well. And there's this mysterious mother figure because he's telling these stories to his kid, his kids. And there's like a yellow umbrella and I could take or leave the rest of the series, but the yellow umbrella was fascinating to me and how it kept changing hands between Ted and his future wife. Um, but they never met each other. Like one of them would leave it behind at a club and the other one would pick it up. And then like, like it gets forgotten in places and found. And it's this idea of falling in love with somebody without actually having met them. And then when you see them with this like symbolic item, you know, oh, this is the person that I want to be with, even if I don't know them yet. And I was like, that's really cute. We could turn that into a, into a TTRPG because of like the tricks of like, you know, when you get really frustrated in the movies because people are running around trying to find each other and they're just missing the, the <laughs> other person. And you're like, just turn around, just turn around. He's right behind you. Um, what if you did that intentionally with one of your friends though? Um, is... It was kind of like my thought on that. Um, and it's like building this romantic tension, like a uh, bully pulpit star crossed um, in a way, which was also like a, another kind of inspiration. And I don't know, it's a deep cut. If anyone's seen the movie August Rush uh, with Freddie Highmore in it, like his, his parents in the movie have that kind of, they keep going to the same place to meet, um, but like they're going on the wrong days and just missing each other and that kind of thing. And I'm just like, as a fan of romance, because I like it when people fall in love and are happy in that way, I was like, ah, oh, that's lovely. Like people like to flirt with their friends, like in like, like whatever TTRPG campaign you're playing. Hmm. What if we just focused on that, on that first bit? What if we really honed in? Cause then it could be like a lead in for people's backstories or if people just want to like make a romantic drama or a romantic comedy because they don't see themselves in it, that is something that they can also do. Yeah. And I thought it would be fun. I think is is the at the end of the day the um the inspiration. It was something that I thought would be fun to do, and it's the kind of game I want to play because we are now in rough layout in terms of like where the game is on the timeline. Yeah. And like the game is the game the core game is done. And I want to play it so bad. <laughs> like, I know you should make games that you want to play. But, like, all of my other games, like, for example, there's a game I have called Family Album. I have never played that game. I will never play that game um, for, you know, reasons. But not yet is a game that I'm like, oh, I need to play this right now. Who is free? Oh, wait, nobody actually knows what the rules are yet, except for the other people <laughs> on the team. Uh, right. I'll just have to, I'll just have to wait. I'll just have to wait. Um, but oh, we hit all of our stretch goals. And I'll be honest, there was a point that I didn't think that we would, just because this was my first ever Kickstarter. Um, it's a small game. Like, I was like, a thousand pounds is more money than any of 
my games possibly combined has ever made not including like the um the third party projects that i've been that i've been on hmm. um so i was like i i had faith in my community that we would fund but i wasn't sure that we would hit all the stretch goals and the people in the ttrpg industry and community at large really rallied and helped me like helped promote the work and we did it and oh this is gonna be such a good project product i'm so excited and i'm very very grateful um to like fiona over at what am i rolling and mark j over at apochromatic unlimited and every single person who like boosted my project in their newsletters to like get it out there because like i mean speechless i think is is at the end of the day and you're like, I want to make something. And the, and people are like, yes, we want you to make this thing. And that is so heartwarming uh, as an indie creator. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, second, Fiona is, is, is fantastic. Uh, but you've also got a fantastic voice joining you on the project as well uh, <sighs> that listeners may have heard from some other well-known Absolutely incredible podcast. What was it like to bring on Aaron uh, as one of the stretch goals? Uh, so, Aaron, honestly, I fangirled a lot when Aaron said yes. Yeah. So, Aaron Katano Saez uh, of All My Fantasy Children podcast fame. Um, I met him at Big Bad Con in 2022. So, the first time I'd kind of been to an American con hmm. because he was one of the other POC scholars on the track. Uh, and I was I was that bubbly, uh, I want to call myself a little kid, but I was 25 at the time. <laughs> um, like going and trying to meet all of the other scholars because they are my peers. And I think that games are best made with people at your level, you know. So I met Aaron, I, like started listening to his podcast. Like I, I thought it was great. I love his voice. He's such a funny and kind guy. Um I saw him again at Big Bad Con in 2023. And so when we were kind of looking at Not Yet, I was like, for accessibility reasons, because not everyone learns by reading things. Some people really struggle with that. Um, audiobooks are really, really good. It's either audiobooks or short how-to YouTube videos. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, this is kind of inspired by, this game is inspired by romance novels. It'd be great to have um, an audiobook version of it as like, as like our first major stretch goal. Who would I want to voice that? I know Aaron. I've, I like, I'll ask. I'll shoot my shot and be like, "Hey, do you want to do this weird project with me?" <laughs> uh, and Aaron, being an absolute sweetheart, said yes. Uh, and his budget was something that, like, his his price point was something that we could work into the budget. And I was like, "Perfect, we're gonna do this." Um, and this was something that I really, really wanted. I wanted the excuse to work with Aaron. I wanted the audio book because, like, for example, both of my younger siblings struggle uh, with reading TTRPGs. So it's either I teach them or I put them to a YouTube video. How? Mm. So being able to be like, hey, siblings, listen to this. <laughs> this is a game that I made. <laughs> what do you think? Um, is something that is very important to me personally. Um, so this is like when I say a dream come true, like honestly, again, fangirl could not keep my cool. <laughs> did a little dance in my living room, uh, and then wrote a very professional email back, as is the British way. <laughs> oh, now very restrained and professional. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. Stiff, stiff upper lip, and all that sort of good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So, having sort of delved in. Deep, deep into your own Kickstarter project, worked with these incredible people, in, in Fiona, Aaron, and, and others that we've mentioned. And, and those that we haven't mentioned are also clearly incredible as well. Uh, so congratulations to you and the entire team on your Kickstarter. Um, what has it been like stepping away from the game design and being part of a production team for an, an actual play uh, with respect to Tales of Sinayuna? What was that like? Um, so... Tales for Sina Una is, so it has had actual plays and I am actually involved in behind the scenes production stuff for actual plays. Um, but what Tales of Sina Una is, is it's a pre-colonial D&D, uh, like it's a pre-colonial Philippines 
like D and D adventure anthology. So this is the sequel to Islands of Sina Una, which is a uh, a setting book. Hmm. Um, and so this was this was my first official time in like a producer or project manager role, um, and it has been the biggest learning experience because before. I've always kind of been doing project management in a very volunteer based role, basically like on what do you need? How can I help Um, kind of thing, offering assistance um, where I can see that people might need help. But this one is like, okay, you are doing the role. You are doing all of the project management. Um, You're like kind of doing all of the overview. You're responsible for hiring which was the first time I'd ever had to kind of like think about who we would bring onto a project. Um, and then I'm also um, helping out with like promotion and stuff, which includes like liaising with various podcasts for actual plays when the uh, book is ready for release. And it yeah. is very, very close. You know, when, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make myself sound a little bit bad. <laughs> Um, you know when there's a lot of responsibility for the first time, like you go into like a, a job for the first time and you're like, Oh, there is like a big weight on my shoulders because yeah. I don't want to mess this up. Um for me as a producer for Tales from Scenic, you know, there is a huge weight on my shoulders of I wanna get this book out, I wanna get this book out to a good quality because the writers did such incredible jobs designing their adventures and I can't wait for them to be showcased on actual plays and I can't wait for the for the backers to get their hands on these adventures because some of them have just left me like jaw dropped. Like I I can't give I can't give spoilers. Um <laughs> but you know, when it's just kinda like and then the potential afterwards for what the GMs can can do with them going forwards is amazing. And being responsible for making sure that these adventures are like preserve the author's voices um, and go out in, into um, the world as something very unique is a huge responsibility that I am doing my best to kind of live up to and do my best for. So, yeah. But also, I feel like this gives permission for people to be nervous in their first time in a big role, um, because the thing, the issue with TTRPGs, uh, and this is my personal hot take that I'll defend, uh, like I'll I'll die on this hill, is that learning how to do the roles. If you don't come from another industry that has a similar role, and you're going and you're entering a role through TTRPGs and TTRPGs alone, which a lot of us are. There is no formal like learning opportunities. Like you can do a game design di- game design course at university, but is it? It's not gonna be like the game design that you actually do um, in the industry. Like there is no formal way. There's no one who's gonna be like, this is how you write for D and D. This is how you write a like ability check. <laughs> like um there are like informal blog posts and stuff but you don't know they exist unless you go and do the research and find them yeah it's like you don't know how to do your taxes or like for example for kickstarter bring, bringing it back a little bit it's like when i was trying to fill out the like kind of application form there was like a question that completely stumped me and i went around and asked everyone that i knew and everyone had different <laughs> answers on how to do it <laughs> and i was like i don't want hmrc to come and attack me because i did it wrong mm. um and so yeah being a producer was really scary because I was kind of like this is my first time doing this formally like I'm in charge of people getting paid I am getting paid for this yeah um and there is no formal way to learn that unless you're going to go away and do like extensive research and then try and figure out what people online are telling you how to do and then like turn and fit that into what you actually have to do yeah so yeah, my my hot take is that but there is no formal way to learn things other than mentorship and like figuring out like researching and then trying to make that apply. Um, so there are a lot of things that a producer has to do, and it's okay if you t- if you decide to take on a project management creative lead producer role in TTRPG game design and you get overwhelmed and intimidated because you're like oh i didn't realize there was this much to do mm. that's okay i'm giving i'm giving you listener the the one of you who's like oh thank goodness someone else feels this way too <laughs> i'm like i see you i give you permission to feel that way 
and I, I, if no one else takes, I will take that. I will take that on and say thank you for that. Um, speaking of mentorships and, and sort of how to help, there has been uh, a collective brought together, a storytelling collective uh, that has gathered to try and help people produce works um, to, to the standards and, and, and generate these things. Uh, the Storytelling Collective, of which you have been uh, named as a creative laureate, what has that been like to take on such a, I, I'm actually going to say prestigious title because it's had some fantastic people take on that role in the past. Oh, 100%. Definitely a, uh, a prestigious title and something that when I received the email saying that I was going to be one of the laureates this year, um, I was absolutely stunned because there are so many amazing people in the TTRPG industry doing like so many interesting things um last year my friend lila was one of the creative laureates um uh, was selected for her kickstarter jukebox which is a karaoke ttrpg <laughs> musical uh game which is so different like like literally the mechanics of it you sing like you have to choose a song that is relevant and like um, to the narrative that you're trying to tell um, and it change and it l- changes the story it's like like the, the level of game design that goes into that and being able to communicate that and like it's gone through loads of playtesting and it's been so successful and I was like that's incredible yes you deserve to be a creative laureate Lila you did it you did incredible last year and the Kickstarter did incredible and I'm very proud of of Lila Fujiwara and all of the work that she has done um but so when I so when I got it I was shocked because I am like I again I'm kind of just what is what is the correct term like I, I don't want to say bobbing along because then I'll start singing the song from Bed Knobs and Broom Six, but um, yeah, you know exactly what I mean. Um, but I'm kind of making my way, figuring it out. I have some very good mentors who are kind of guiding me, but I guess I'm in my kind of weird indie era. I started very much in D and D, five E territory, and I'm kind of straying more and more towards. Um, indie stuff making my own games running kickstarters for my own games um so when i applied to be a creative laureate i was like hey i want to do i want to make a zine but i want to make a zine at a con with loads of people and do like this big community thing because one of the things that is really important to me um and is becoming more and more important to me is the sense of like community because game designs game experiences are supposed to be shared like we create even solo games like it's a shared experience between the game designer and the person playing or it's it's people who have played and then they're comparing their experiences um but what often happens in ttrpgs especially for freelancers of which i am one is we get our assignments we go our separate ways we write our part of the game and then it's given to one other person who then edits it all and makes it a cohesive thing um or it's all very segmented and I don't like that. It's very lonely. And I think when you're lonely and you're making a game that's supposed to be enjoyed by a group of people, that is not correct. That is not, like, it just, it feels wrong in my soul. Um, But, I mean, it has its benefits, like, from remote working, like, the barrier of entry to game design is the lowest it's ever been. Mm. Um, And that is fantastic, but also... I don't feel like game designers should feel so isolated. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do this year is really focus on like com- the communal aspect of game design. So it's like, yeah, I want to go to a con and sit down with a stack of paper, some pens, some ink stamps, and just over the course of like 72 hours, create a game with whoever has five minutes to sit down with me. You know, it's like, oh, you want to play test and you've got an hour free? Let's let's play with what we've already got. You want to create an NPC? Come and sit down um, and just write out what this character is. Oh, you want to like do a cover? Fantastic. This is kind of what the game is evoking right now. What can you whip up in 20 minutes? Mm. Um, and that is what I kind of approached the, the storytelling collective with. And they were interested in, in seeing how my journey in community 
is going and that all started with chef's to party which is a game i released in january where i was like oh i want to make a game about cooking with your adventuring party i can't make this by myself because i'm supposed to be cooking with an adventuring party so here are the base instructions i'm gonna go out find some of my peers and be like hey do you want to make recipes for different systems to showcase how the game works and then also i've got people who are cooking with me on in this in this like um like ttrpg mini game yeah so oh sorry i i keep going on tangents but bringing it back it's all good it is all good (laughs) thank you thank you but yeah bringing it back uh it is important to me to showcase how we can put the kind of communal aspect back in uh game design and i am very grateful to the storytelling collective for giving me the opportunity and the spotlight to kind of show my journey on that. Will I complete it in a year? To be seen. But it is something that I am working very hard towards because I want it for myself and I want it for my peers. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something we'll definitely be keeping a a track of. That sounds like surveillance. A project will be following with you uh, as it progresses. (laughs) So uh, expanding beyond the community aspects you mentioned there in game design what else have have you learned what's sort of some of the biggest things you've learned either as a game designer or a game master in that respect that you would you would like to share with others but maybe haven't had the the, the platform in that respect to, to share some advice uh up until up until this moment right now hmm, thank you uh, i think my big thing uh is for anyone who's interested in game design but they're like oh i've never been a gm i had never gm'd before i started designing games um even now i don't when i do play tests uh, i don't gm my own stuff i get somebody else to do it because it helps them it, and it helps me if i know whether they understood the stuff or not but yeah no you don't have to you don't have to be a gm to get into game design uh you can just have ideas and write them down and figure out how to communicate them and then get other people to run it like i feel like uh there's like this expectation sometimes of like oh you have to have done x y and z before you can be a game designer that's not true if you have played a single game that has a like i guess not even dice because some games use like playing cards and tarot cards um and uh generic tumbling towers um if you've played a game like that and you have an idea and you are able to write that idea down on a piece of paper you are a game designer that is uh that is it i think uh in terms of 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 that in terms of like my one weird piece of advice because people will tell you like all sorts of pragmatic things like oh this is how you do this or this is how you could break into the industry um there is no one way to do it everybody's story is different and you'll hear it from like people at all levels like i'll tell you my story but that's not gonna work for you because it barely worked for me (laughs) um and, like but it's true it's it it's it's true we all came into this from so completely different walks of life and that is because the ttrpg industry as we understand it is only about 20 years old so we're like it's very very new mm. still in terms of like how industries age i guess um so yeah just make a game yeah Do just, just go i believe for it. in you we 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 both believe in you we believe in you. You can you can do this, and there is you don't have to have any experience. You don't have to have written fan fiction or original fiction or like games are more like technical manuals. You don't have to have written one of those either. <laughs> like you can you can do it if you've got the idea in your head and the means to share it. Absolutely, we believe in you. I think is is where we're going with that. So yeah. you are a actual play producer you are a game designer you are a kickstarter you are a just content creator creative laureate you're incredibly do do you get downtime do what do you do away from the ttrpg space do you have time for you do you have time uh so i am a mother of two uh i am a mother of two children who are both under the age of eight years old um 
So my downtime is usually playing a uh, video game or um, oh, what would you call here to slay? I, it's like a card game, hmm. but not quite. I do play I do play trading card games um, with my eldest as well. Um, but when I kind of remove myself completely from gaming and I have a little bit of time to myself, uh, and I'm not like watching or listening to actual plays, uh, I knit and crochet. Um, is my big thing. I'm getting really back big into coloring because I just find it very like cathartic and therapeutic. Um, but TTRPGs pretty much encompasses my life outside of my kids. So <laughs> there's, there's not a lot, but it's all creative. I like I like creating things, whether it's just for myself or whether it's like as as gifts for other people. Uh, all of my hobbies. Uh, you'll find I have made something. Fair enough. Well, let me ask you a slightly different question then. So you have, you've played 5e, you've, you've used other systems as a basis for games you've designed, you've experienced other systems. What systems have you played that you really liked or what systems haven't you played yet that you would like to play? So games or game systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of my favorite game systems is made by Puna M and Arman Babu, who were both on the Kickstarter, but not yet as part of the core team. It's called Love is on the Cards, and you uh, make a Christmas rom-com. So the, so the way you do it is like you draw cards and they are different prompts um, for you and one other player. And I have never seen a game that nails like the genre and the pacing so exactly i've played it a couple of times over on the desis and dragons twitch channel and when i say i had so much fun each time because you you draw a card and you're like oh yeah i've seen this in every single christmas rom-com like they just get the tropes in there um so well it's so well designed i absolutely love that um that's the system that i enjoy um i also really enjoy um by again by my friend arman um, it's a game called Even Dragons Are Trampled Before Us. It's a game where you play as horses um, and there's been a dragon invasion on the kingdom, but the humans have run away scared. So it's up to the horses to um, to defeat the dragons. It's a very silly game and it's, it's like rolling dice pulls against one another. Um, and this is actually one that I, this is like the only game that I've uh, fully GM'd. Um, because I'm running like this anime style, like really dramatic uh, horses, like waving swords about in with their teeth and using flags to like become wings and fly. <laughs> uh, and it's like this very silly, like suspending belief and just leaning into like mm. the, I guess, like the whimsical side of what fantasy can be, uh, which I really love. Games that I want to play, Good Society, because regency romance and that kind of stuff i like romance with rules i don't know if you can tell by the romance games that i have made unplugged but um good society is a game that i really 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 want to play um and i think i might have the opportunity to do that soon so watch this space um the corrupted um so i'm listening to an actual play called ties that bind and the corrupted is the system that they use for that it's inspired by the last of us and the walking dead um, and telling like it, like I don't know if other people do this, but sometimes I'll see something on the news and I'll be like, if this turned into a zombie apocalypse, how would I survive it? Um, <laughs> like one of the one of the formative books of my uh, teen years is the Zombie Survival Guide and World War Z. Those two books um, were really big for me. So it's like so getting to actually play a game that is based specifically around like that zom uh, that zombie survival horror. Um, is something that I would really like to do. Um, and then, are there any other systems that I really want to try? There, are, Basically, if there's a one-page game out there, I want to try it, because I, they're so easy to just pick up and play, especially if you've got, like, some players missing. Mm. Uh, so, like, Lasers and Feelings is one that people are very well aware of that I would like to do. Um... Oh gosh, there was a game I saw on Twitter like a couple of weeks back, and it was about being like it's like it was like a solo game where you pretend to be a lawyer but you're a cat, 
um, and you're like the pet of like a lawyer who's like overslept or something. So you've got to go and win a huge court case. <laughs> uh, and I was like, and it's, and it's not a channeling game either. It's literally a solo role playing game. And there's like, you get extra points if you pace the room and meow as like your closing statement or something like that. Uh, and I was like, oh, that sounds like so much fun. Uh, so yeah, basically any systems that are on a single page, I probably want to play. <laughs> That is amazing. Amazing. Uh, that cat one sounds a lot of fun. Uh, it so... does, doesn't it? I've got it bookmarked somewhere. I have to find it. <laughs> if you do, let me know. I will. I will. Amazing. So we have talked about the work you have created, the work that you are ongoing, the work that is coming up and all these sorts of good things and sort of what you do outside. Is there anything at this point of the interview that we haven't discussed that you would like to bring up now, Taylor? Oh my goodness. You know when you have so much going on, but so much of it is under NDA, and you're like, ah, is there anything that I can actually <laughs> talk about? And I, and I think we've kind of covered everything that I am able to talk about at this point. Uh, I will say that um, when I started 2024, um, I didn't have a lot of freelancing work, and I was like, that's okay. Uh, 2024 for me is going to be the year of gaining experience. I'm going to run my own projects. You know, I'm going to do my own things and I'm going to gain the skills necessary to get to my dream job. Uh, Cause my dream job is like being a creative lead for like a, like a big IP and like making like that thing that loads of people want a reality. Yeah. Cause I'm nothing if not a support character and I want to make people's dreams come true. Um, so there is a lot going on for me this year that I can't talk about because as I've started gaining experience, uh, people have started looking and recognizing and bringing me on to things uh, that I can't talk about yet. So please be sure to follow me on social media because when I do get the opportunity to talk about them, oh, I am not going to shut up. Like there are some <laughs> exciting things that are happening uh, and I, and I, I'm so honoured that I get the opportunity to do them. <laughs> all right. Well, so we can support you now and in the future when all these exciting things that you are not allowed to discuss at this point in time, at time of recording, uh, do come out and, and I'll be looking out for them myself. Uh, where can we find you on social media and on the internet, please, Taylor? Uh, so my website is taylornavarrottrpgs.card.co. That is where you'll find links to all of the stuff that I'm currently doing, all of my previous work and all of my social media profiles. Um, if you're not bothered with websites, you can go to twitter.com because it is still twitter.com to me uh, and find me at Taylor and NX. So that's T-A-Y-L-O-R-A-N-N-N-X. <laughs> All right. Well, I will put uh, those links down in the description below, along with uh, some of the things we've, we've spoken about during the course of this interview. Taylor, I would love to get you back on the show in the future once more of these projects come out, once uh, some of these big new excitements, uh, uh, big new announcements, sorry, big exciting announcements. I'm, I'm too excited to say the sentence. Uh, me too, me too. <laughs> um, if, you know, if you'd be willing to come back and join me, of course. I would absolutely love to. This has been a lovely chat. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, and yeah, we will definitely get that organized and sorted out. Taylor, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart uh, for games from yours. Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about the show, then go to www.snydersreturn.squarespace.com. Alternatively, you can find us over on Twitter at Return Snyder. We have a link tree link in the description of this episode. And if you want to support us, come and join us over on Patreon. And we also have a Discord server. Uh, please leave us a review because we'd love to learn how to improve the channel and provide better content out for, for those who are listening. Uh, until, we, uh, until we speak again, thank you. <laughs>